So we want to welcome everyone in every location, wherever you're joining us, whether that's on TV, online, wherever you are, we're so glad you joined us for this series, Upside Down, Inside Out. And uh, this is part two. We started off uh, last week so great, I think, with that whole message that, you know, the church, it's not about where we go, it's who we are. And we've got to get this into ourselves because we, have, we might put on a great event, you might be in like church today, uh, you might be in a building, but we've got to realize that when we leave, <laughs> we don't leave the church behind, we are the church. And we've got to get this into our hearts. And so we're going to be moving into something else. Now this whole concept of uh, inside out, upside down is really looking at what Jesus says about the church, uh, about who we are as his people uh, because sadly, through our belief systems, many of us, we got mixed up with religion. And religion is toxic and poisonous. And what happens is it gets in our system, and often we don't know it's in there till we start feeling sick. And some of us are even sick right now, and I'm speaking to some sick people. Uh, his word wants to come and clean you, purify you, and it says he wants to come in and bring truth. Because we get wrapped up in what we think is God's ideas, but they're really man's inventions. And, uh, you know, just, just, I, I just think of Jesus, the way that he, when he came to this earth, at that time, uh, being close to God and uh, going after God and all that sort of being church, religious, whatever you want to call it, it was being around people that were also holy. And it was like, you don't mix with the sinners. Jesus comes, turns it all inside out. Do you know what he does? He keeps hanging out with the sinners. And he got criticized. You know, the religious people of the day that were all the pure and holy ones, they came along and they said, Jesus, if you only knew who you were mixing with, they're a bunch of sinners. And he said, this is who I've come for. Yeah. See, there's something about inside out, because even as, as Christians, we like to sort of draw in our nice, tidy lives, whereas Jesus kept going into the mess. And you see, the church is designed to operate behind enemy lines. Anyway, we're not covering that. That's what inside out is. It's changing our thinking. It's like, oh, yeah, we just got to hang out with the, you know, with, with, with the religious and the good people. Jesus said, no, you've got to go to the lost. You've got to shine your light. And so there is something powerful about understanding his word because that brings freedom. But this is what we're going to do today. We're going to have some fun today. You can see we've got some, uh, oh, we've got a loaf of bread. <laughs> I'm going to be throwing out bread later, so just wait on. <laughs> And th this is really awesome. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the myth, because that's how we started last week. It's like, what is the myth that people buy into? And this week's myth is, the church exists to meet my needs. The church exists to meet my needs. Isn't that true? Now, th this is quite funny, because there's an element of it that is true, right? Because the church is here for the lost. But I'm talking to you believers right now. Surely the church exists for the non-believers. And I know that every Christian can say how Jesus continually meets their need. Yeah? But you come with me on this journey because I think that we have bought in often to this thinking that I go to church to have my needs met. And if that is a motivation we lose something very important. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a little story going back years and years ago when we were building church. We built a church that was around people's needs. And there's many churches today. Do you know what I mean? If you can like meet people's needs, more people will come to your church. And so I was like trying to be the super pastor. I used to go to like visit people in the hospitals. You know, if anyone had a need, we'd do it. If there was counseling, we'd do it. We did the youth work. We did the kids work. We did sort of holiday clubs. We did like everything that was going on, on the street. We did evangelism because I felt as the leader, and this was really bad. I felt like I had to meet people's need. And I built a church and I built a church probably where people came to have their needs met. And we know that Jesus meets our needs, but when we build something that people come to have their needs met soon, do you know what happens? You disappoint someone. Actually, I think I disappointed quite a few people. I disappointed more people that left than stayed. 
because I built this idea that the church is there to fulfill people's needs. We had, we decided sort of years and years ago, we decided to have a great, it was a great idea, let's take the church out of the four walls and we're going to have a tent and we're going to have this like, you know, church healing. We called it a crusade. I don't know if it was a good idea, but we called it like, yeah, we're going to have this healing meetings in the tent. We put it in the middle of our town on the sort of council green. We got permission and we sort of got this special speaker in who came in and we sort of, you know, he, he just had this gift of like seeing healing and people got healed. He came in, hundreds of people came. We were like 40 people in the church at the time. So we thought, this is revival. And now this is really interesting because we're always looking for revival outside of ourselves. When the revival happens in ourselves. And what we're saying, this is it. This is like the quick fix. This is the, this is the thing that's going to work. And we, we sort of, I think, had two, three nights where this went on. And we saw, I think we saw over 100 people choose to follow Christ. Right? We're a church of four. Can you imagine? It was like, we thought Revival Central for us. This small market town. It was amazing. So afterwards, we, we had their names and their contact details. So then, as a small church, we set about going to visit them. And we went to visit them and say, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to connect. How about coming along to where we meet so that you can grow your faith? And these people had responded, not for coming to know Jesus and to follow him, but they'd responded, as we found out. They responded because they wanted to get healed. Because they had a need and we advertised healing crusade, they all came to get healed and so when they were asked, do you want to follow Jesus? They thought, well, if it means I'm going to get healed, I'm following Jesus. But when it came to actually having a conversation, do you know what? Out of 112 people, two people came to the church. Because we built a needs-based church that was just trying to say, hey. And people came because they had a need, but they didn't want to follow Jesus. Woo. We ended up after that being left with, uh, I think the two people that did come, she got taken away in the ambulance because she had a seizure the first time she came to church, never came back again. And, uh, and, and then the council banned us from meeting in the place because we made too much noise. Couldn't ever meet there again. And then thirdly, someone tripped over the fence in and decided to sue us. So I'm there thinking, Jesus, I'm doing this all for you. And God was taking us on a journey of saying, how long are you going to try and meet people's needs? You're building a, you're building a community or you're trying, to build, you're trying to focus on, we want to meet your need. We want to meet your need. And it doesn't work. Even Jesus, I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to show you that this happened with Jesus. We're going to look at John chapter 6. This is fascinating. So let's look at John 6. Oh, right before this, right before this, I just want to set the scene Right before we start off here, something has happened. Feeding of the 5,000. Sounds familiar? So Jesus just performs this incredible miracle. He feeds 5,000 people. And like, you know, there's even like stuff left over. And it was just from some loaves and fishes. It's like an incredible miracle. And all these people are gathered and everywhere Jesus goes, they follow. Because they're coming after him, you see. They're coming after him. And then he starts to teach on being the bread of life. That's not why I got the bread up there, but it's something about the bread of life. And he's saying, do you know what? I'm the bread of life. And they're trying to get their head around this. He also, he touches on what communion is. And he starts saying, do you know what? You're going to drink of my blood and eat of my flesh. He's talking about communion. And they all get upset. So I don't know how many, there, there might have been seven, eight thousand. I don't know how many people were around, but there was a lot of people. There was over 5,000. Then we pick up this scripture. So he does the teaching and then in uh, verse 60 to 61, it says, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? This is Jesus. Now, this gives me great hope. When people don't get the message, I'm thinking, Jesus, they did it with you. Aware that his disciples were grumbling. So his disciples, they were, they were moaning and criticizing. Imagine 5,000. They're there. And they're saying, he's gone too far right now. I think he's like put the bar in a place we can't get to. We're not happy about this. We came for something, but this is going to cost us. That's not like us, is it? We don't come to Jesus for what we can get. 
to meet our need. And then when he asks us something that's going to cost, we say, hey, that's a bit hard. And this is what happens. Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Well, Jesus knew. Basically, he's saying, you lot are offended. And some of us have walked away from Jesus because we got offended. Some of us have walked away from our church because we got offended through maybe some teaching, through, hey, we're going to do this, through some vision, walked away. And this is what happened with Jesus. After this, do you know what happened? A lot of his disciples left. Now, when it says a lot, it means most. Can you imagine, like, you know, he's done some teaching. This is Jesus, but he knows what he's doing. He's fed 5,000. You would think, wouldn't you? We just saw the miracle. We actually took part of the miracle. We're there. We've eaten it. We, he, like, he satisfied us. Here he is. And he says, now I want to teach you about the bread of life. And because they find it too hard, they forget the miracle, and they end up moving into a fence. You can be part of the greatest miracle in your life, and you can have your need met in your life. But do you know what? If we're still coming after him over our need, we can get into trouble. So it says, thousands left him. They didn't want to be associated with him. That's Jesus, the one who was performing miracles and speaking truth like no one else, and they left him. See, I know within me there is something in me that wants to do my own thing, and when I don't like what I hear, I want to walk away from it. But Jesus said, you need to follow me. You need to follow me. Then Jesus gave the 12 their chance. Because it was like everyone else was going. And he says, do you also want to leave? The 12 disciples. Because Jesus never keeps on to reluctant followers. And in the early years, I thought that it was my job to try and keep people happy when Jesus was saying, no, I just want to make people holy. And there was something releasing about realizing, I'm going to do everything I can to reach people. But we're here for the lost. We're here on a mission as the called out ones. We're here for unity. We're here so we can be outward looking, not inward focused. And you see, this is what he's saying. He said, this is all about you, isn't it? And he called it. This is, you know, he called it and he said, is this what it's all about? So I want to ask this question. This is a question that I continually ask myself and I want us to ask ourselves. What is the basis of my attachment to Jesus. I think that's what he was saying. He was saying to the disciples, okay, can I ask you this one thing? It's not about the miracles. It's not about that prophetic word. See, we think it is. It's not about answering that prayer. What is the attachment that you have with Jesus right now? What's it based on? That he turns out for me. That he's going to answer this that I go to a good church. What is is the basis of my attachment? And that's what we're going to look at in this because I think it's so important we understand it. You see, many people go to church. I know I'm speaking to some locations now around the world where, you know, we, we turn up, we've turned up to an event and we come. Do you know why many of us come? We come for a blessing. We come so that we can get a blessing. Maybe you've been out of church for two, three weeks and things haven't gone well. So you've come back to get a bit of forgiveness, to get a word from the Lord and that encouragement and to sing a bit of worship so you all feel gooey inside. And then from there, you can go off and live your life how you were living before until two, three weeks time. And you're in a cycle right now that you've been in probably for many years And God wants to break that cycle. It's called religion. It is something that means that I can go and act how I want, behave how I want. I'm going to turn up to church for my needs. When things go wrong, what do we do? We pray more. And when things are going well, we tend to draw away. I've seen people have the answers and the blessing. Sometimes the greatest blessing can become the greatest issue in your life. Because you think, now I've got this, I can now sort of do my own thing. But when we're in great need, we turn to him. But it can be a big, big challenge. And so we've got to watch out because you see blessing, you do get blessed by following Jesus. But you know blessing is a byproduct of following Jesus. 
Because I know many Christians that follow Jesus and they, they might not have a great big story of lots of blessing. It's been tough and it's been hard work. There are people in our world right now that following Jesus, you don't say, hey, I just followed Jesus because of the blessing. I followed him because he's my savior. I followed him because I know he has the words of truth and life. And there is something that I can't go anywhere else but after him. But if it's about blessing, if it's about, you know, the, many people also go to church in different countries because of what? So they can get blessed. And I mean, so they can become prosperous. So they can get the job that they've been looking for for two years. So that they can perhaps, I don't know, somehow I'm going to get that new car. You think this is crazy, but the, many people, I'm speaking to some people right now. You you come to church and maybe you want someone to pray for you because you think somehow that's going to create prosperity in your life, that is not what Jesus said. It's not, what it's, it's not about what you can get, it's actually about what you can give. So I don't know where you got, got that from. But the church, in its religious thinking, and there are some churches right now, today, this morning, that have been um, handing out water that they are saying is holy. And uh, people are coming and purchasing. They pay for the water that's holy. They can give them a bit. And they can drink it. And in drinking it, they're probably going to get the job that they wanted. They're probably going to be more financially better off. You can also go and purchase some flour. And this flour has been blessed by the leaders. And that flour, you can make bread. And when you eat that bread, it's just going to make you prosper. And if you're sick, it could heal you as well. And there are cues. I'm talking... Hundreds of people queuing up because it's far easier to go and buy something to say, I've got my need and this is going to fulfill it rather than living a life that is in sacrifice to who Jesus is. That means, you see, that means I can give my money, put my coin in the slot, get the, the prize without having to change anything in my life. I just turn up to this thing called church because it's there for my needs. So guys, this is something that is relevant and we need to recognize it as the church. We need to see it and recognize it. Um, I want to... <laughs> I just want to do something right now. I hope this is going to work. Because I know for many of us, we can think, well, we'd never queue up for some flour, would we? We don't go to church because of our needs, do we? Ready? Ready? Now, before we start, guys, I just want to share some, I want to get some off my chest. Has anyone been shopping with their wife? It's like, do you know what? I've driven in Asia, Africa, Cambodia. I've driven some crazy roads. I've found, you know, in the middle of the jungle, I found my way through. Can I follow my wife in a supermarket? No. It's like, she says to me, just follow me. And, and I'm trying to follow, but she just like doesn't keep to the route. She sort of just goes off. Anyway, that's not the point. I'm just... Phew. So I want to introduce you to supermarket Christianity. We turn up with our trolley probably most weeks. We have an expectation of what we're... We want from church our needs. By the way, some, sometimes these aren't our needs, they're just our wants. And we turn up, and uh, we turn up to the shelves. <laughs> and this isn't like anyone I'm talking to at all. But this is, this is what we do. We turn up, and it's like, wow, wow. Um, do you know what? I think church, when we turn up at church, and we, all of us turned up once at church, Right? As Christians. I'm not, if, if you don't know Jesus, this is, you are welcome and you come and you come with your needs. Right? But when you walk with Jesus, and if you're a believer, I'm talking to the followers today, you turn up, you turn up to church, you've got some expectation, especially if you've been around church and been to different churches. But if you're brand new saved, you haven't got a lot of expectation. But supermarket Christianity grows the more we experience different churches. What we do is we come along and we think, well, you know, 
Kids work. Have they got a good kids work? I know right now in some of our locations, when you plant church, you start off with like a handful. You've got three kids in the kids work. We started that way. People will turn up, families will turn up, and they'll say, let's check out the kids work. And they'll look, and they'll make a decision based on going to that church on how good the kids work is. And the thing is, I know in the early years, some parents left our church because they found a bigger kids work only years later for their kids to stop following Jesus because there was no life in what was happening within the gathering of the church. But you see, you know, as good parents, we're going to go to the best kids' work. Churches right now advertise the best kids' work and the best provision because it meets our need as parents. No, you need to be great parents for your kids. So it might be, hey, I, I do think that's a great thing to have on my trolley. So that's coming with me. Um, oh, this, this is a great one. This is a big one. Big one. This one is, if you haven't got it, it's a great album. Uncharted. <laughs> Advertising right now. <laughs> we are, I'm telling you guys, we, we're doing, I don't know if I should say this, but we're, we're going to be doing a live album soon. Uh, but anyway, right now, worship. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the number one things we have seen people arrive in our church and not stay because they found the worship too loud. They found the style of worship not approving. They loved every other thing, but they didn't like the worship. It's been controversial right through building church. Now, it isn't just because we got lights and we're in a big thing and it's loud. This happened when we were a small church. People would say, I have to put my fingers in my ears. I think there's only like six of us. And worship, and I knew right from the beginning, if I was going to build worship around what people wanted, we were never, ever going to keep anyone happy. Worship is a massive thing, and I know some people, they will come into church according to, we like the style of worship. And maybe if, I don't know, if there was a few more, uh, you know, windows around here, you know, we could look, we could look out and the light was in, we'd feel closer to God. Think back to Jesus, right? Um, the words that he said. Sorry, this is, this is real. There are so many things. Some people don't find the worship lively enough. It's like, what the heck? So worship, that is a huge part. I'm going to go for that because I just think that new album is going to be amazing. <laughs> so, oh, this is a great one, great one. I want a church that really preaches a great word. Don't we all? (laughs) And um, I I want to go to a church that's like, do you know what, you go there and you just get fed. It's like, oh, he's going to teach me about like, you know, the tabernacle of David and stuff like that, you know. It's like, I'm just going to like just be, I'm going to have so much noise. Those communicators are great. Sorry, the Pharisees knew more than probably all of us. They knew they had knowledge, knowledge. (laughs) See, we can come and say, well, it's the word, isn't it? So I'm going to have a bit of that because I don't want too much. (laughs) And then, and then what about, what about youth ministry? (laughs) Youth ministry, do you know what I mean? I'll tell you what, I think we spend too much money on the youth ministry, so I'm putting it back. Sorry, this is what they come with. Their, it's like, oh, too much of a youth church for me. Too many youth. Youth just like spend all your money, cause a lot of noise. So we won't have that bit. Um, Oh, this one, this one. Do you know what? Many people go to church because of friends. Many people will say, let's go there because I feel attached to the friends or family. And I feel a sense of loyalty. And although 
some of that stuff is toxic and it's unhealthy, I'm going to be a good friend. Be a good follower and follow Jesus. Don't go just because of friends. See, this, this is supermarket. It's like, well, I need friends. Make some new friends. Make some great friends. So I'm not taking you with me. And then, oh, yeah, this is awesome. Awesome, look. You know what this is, don't you? Communion. And it's not necessarily about communion, but when I look at a church, I want to know that they practice communion regularly, you know? And actually, I want to make sure that, you know, that we do it often enough in the way that suits me. So uh, that's going to really help uh, because, you know, I've, I've just got a lot of background stuff about, you know, make sure you practice those things, those ordinances. And uh, don't get me onto baptism. I mean, I also want to make sure that people get baptized properly because there's a way you do it. And, and I'm seriously talking to you now, church. We, we have had people leave our church. They have been happy. They were happy with the word, happy with the worship, happy with the kids' ministry, happy with the youth work. They got upset when we baptized someone because it wasn't quite the way they got teaching from their background. They said, you know what? We're out of here and we're going shopping to another supermarket <laughs> because they do it the way we like it. Over here. But perhaps one or two more. Um, what about... What is that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, this one, this one. Look. I want some Holy Spirit in there. Do you know what I mean? And I'm going along the shelf there and I picked up this one. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't want the extra, extra stuff. You know, I don't want to be over top. I don't want to be over the top. Mild could be risky. I'm going to go for the extra light. There it is. Do you know what I mean? You, you, you don't want to get wrapped up in anything too... So let's go somewhere that isn't going to disturb me too much. And we want to, you know, we obviously want the Holy Spirit in there, but not too much. And there are people not in church today because they don't want to be around the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Lastly, so I need to move on. I can walk off with all these things. And I can, like, I don't know, meet the needs that I'm looking for. Because so people have these needs. Oh, these are priorities. These are needs. These are my preferences. And what it all comes down to is vision. And you see, you can actually come into church and be part of church without accepting the vision. And again, so often we travel and we go on a journey with people that have arrived with an agenda where they have needs they want to fulfill. And when you start saying, this is the vision of the church, we're going to change our small groups and we're going to do a different style and we're going to do it this way and it means we're going to do it. It's like, oh, I'm not sure if I agree with this vision. I'm not really sure if reaching anyone anywhere is really part of my vision. Because that's a bit uncomfortable. I want to be part of one of those churches that don't really challenge you too much. And in fact, I could even go here in the evenings and go here in the mornings. I'm not going to pay for what I'm getting here. I might just put a, you know, a, a, some loose change over here. I'm shopping at one supermarket whilst I'm perhaps giving change at another. But you know what? We've been there for a while and we've given a lot. And so now I'm going to go shopping for another church that meets my needs and I never come to the understanding that the issue is actually with my association with Jesus and it's not to do with the church and the moment that we understand this and get this into our heads do you know what? it's going to be life changing it's going to be life changing I want to go a bit further with you right I want to go a bit further 
and uh, we, we, it might be a little bit longer today, but I just feel I have to bring this home, okay? I want to use the visual so you can remember, because every one of us here right now, probably at some point, if we're not doing it now, have our trolley. And it can rob us from so much. Look at those people that followed Jesus. They were around the miracles. They were around what Jesus did. And it said, it said they didn't want to be associated anymore with him. That's shocking. That can happen to us. So I want to introduce you to these two words. Consumer. This is what the church is made up of. Consumers. Someone who goes to a place for the purpose of what? getting what they need. That's what a consumer is. So I'm going to go to church, to this gathering, to this community. Hey, I'm here, everyone. I'm here. A consumer is I've come because you have a great kids ministry. I like your worship. I like your word. I like the way that you just welcome everyone. And see, all those things are good. But if that's what's motivating us, if that's the attachment, what happens when the kids' work changes? What happens when the worship leader changes? What happens? I did miss a really important one. Some of us go to church because we love the pastor. (laughs) But when the pastor changes, we're happy. We all get home early. Anyway, so, so a consumer is someone, that it's like when that changes and that leader changes, it's like, oh, I don't feel like, you know, I'm not so happy now. Isn't it funny? And we disconnect and this word, you've got to understand what a consumer is. See, we can, we can end up coming for what we want to get. I need this right now. And Jesus never spoke in that way. Whereas the opposite is the consumed. The consumed. When I say someone who's consumed, someone who's absorbed and engrossed by something bigger than self. I want to live a life like that, guys. I want to live a life that is continually wanting to just be a consumer. We all know we're in a huge, this world of just consumerization. You can just like get on, your, on the internet and just can be a consumer so easily. It's like in us, around us, so we spill into church with it. All the different brands, all the different sorts. But someone who is consumed, it's something far bigger than yourself. I want to get consumed by something bigger than myself in this life. I want to live for something bigger than just what I want. Because that's not going to come to anything. It is something that will be lost one day. So I'm going to whiz through this list quick. Because I, I want to just make this so black and white for everyone. Because I know I, sometimes I preach, communicate. We go away and it's like, what was that? And did, did it land? We need to get hold of this. So thinking of these two words. You ready? So we got the consumer and consumed game. And these are attitudes and hearts that I, 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 I've displayed. We can display. First one. The consumer, they commit based upon their feelings. Do I feel like going today? Do I feel like attending small group today? Do I feel, feel, feel? It's nothing more than feelings. There is something like that. We're sort of blown this way and blown that way. Are things going well? Mm, I don't feel like I really need to go. (laughs) Have I got great need? I feel I need to go. Our attachment based upon our feelings. Whereas the consumed... Based it upon conviction. And there's something about, you know what? Hey, I don't feel like going today. Do you think we all just turn up all the time because we just feel like beating? No, it's a conviction that I know this will do me good. It's the best place to be. It's something that I can bring. I have something to offer. The consumer focuses on personal needs. Do you know what I mean? I... This is what I need right now. This is, I'm, I need a word. I need, some encur- I need something. I've gone and I need to be appreciated right now. I need uh, like someone to notice me right now. But the consumed focus on the needs of others. 
It is. When you're consumed, you don't look inward, you look outward. And once you start looking outward, it's so funny how your needs seem to disappear. The consumer, they just struggle to fit, struggle to belong. It's like, I'm not quite sure, you know, I don't know if this is the church for me. I just don't feel I belong. Yeah, because you're a consumer. You got your shopping trolley. You're here to consume. And that can only last so long. Whereas the consumed ensure others belong. I want to just make sure people belong. This is a place where people belong before they believe. This is a place where people can come and be a part. This is a place where we're here for, for the lost. We're here for the non-members. The consumer, focus on the personal preferences. I prefer the way worship is done this way. Or I prefer this type of church service. I prefer, and what we do is, they can be small when we arrive in church, but as we get used to people, we start voicing out our preferences that often are religious thinking that are there to strangle the life out of us, but we voice them as an opinion, and they can become our downfall. The consumed focus on what unites, not on what separates. I've learned, it doesn't mean to say that the consumed haven't got opinions or, or preferences, what they do is they say, actually, yeah, I prefer that. But in the big picture, yeah. oh, <laughs> this is about unity. This is, unity is the number one thing. And I'm going to focus on what's in common rather than what separates. There's always with a consumer an attitude of entitlement and you're never going to fulfill it, I found out. Whereas if you're consumed, you've got an attitude of gratitude. And it means that everything you're involved with, there's just gratefulness, gratefulness. I ain't shopping, I'm here as a distributor. Last one. The consumer asks this key question all the time. Oh, am I valued enough? Do people appreciate me enough? Have people noticed me enough? Whereas the consumer asks, how can I add value? How can I be the one? to bring value to that one person today? How can I add value to that small group? How can I bring something? How can I offer something? How can I be there to make a difference? <sighs> Guys, this is now further on, right? So we're just going to finish off this bit of scripture, John 6, 67, 69. So he says, Jesus says, you don't want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. And Simon Peter asked him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of what? Eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the one, the holy one of God. That's who you are. Guys, you see in Peter the consumed. They've all gone. I think Peter's family have gone because their families would have been involved with the people that rejected Jesus. And so he says to the disciples, Peter, do you want to go as well? He says, he takes a moment, he says, Jesus, this isn't about feeding the 5,000. This isn't about the miracles. This isn't about what you can do for me. This is about who you are. This is about who you are because when you speak, something explodes inside of me. When you speak, Jesus, it's like your words come alive and I can't. Nothing's ever been the same again. There's something about the potential in me that you're speaking to. Jesus, where would I go? Am I going to go to another supermarket, another great preacher that's on the circuit, another Messiah that's meant to be here? You're the one. He says, this is about you. It's about who you are, not about what you do. It's about who you are. And we know Peter followed all the way through. See, this was a test for him. He said, where would we go? I can't get you out of my mind, Jesus. You've consumed me. I'm consumed by something bigger. I'm not here out of duty. I'm here because I'll follow you all the way, even to a cross. That's the consumed. It's not about come and bless me. It can be, Lord, even if I don't get blessed. For the rest of my days. You know, it's, it's like, I'm not looking for this, that, whatever. That's going to happen anyway. I'm coming after you. This is about who you are. I'm going to seek your face, your face, and I'm not going to seek your hand. So 
So we're going to wind up with this couple of pictures. I know this is a bit strange. Pictures of dogs. But this, this is something that happened to me, right? I was up on some mountains on a mountain bike. And uh, I was up by myself, the only person. It's very isolated. I'm up on the top of the mountain. And as I'm up there, I sort of climb the mountain through some sort of streams and a river. And you have to, like, somehow get across the rocks and the stones. So you pick your bike up, you, and you keep going through. And as I did, this dog appeared, this hound. It just appeared. There's, there's nothing around. Just a dog appears in the middle of nowhere. And he looks at me, and I look at him. Thought he'd run off. He just sits and waits for me because I'm, I'm about to cross this river. And, um, and then when I look, another one turns up. Then another, then another. Four. There's four of these dogs, these hounds that are with me, and they all sit around me. I'm not sure if they're going to eat me. <laughs> and they look like almost a bit wild. And uh, they were just like in the middle of nowhere. So anyway, I, I went and crossed the river. And as I crossed the river, they all started howling because they wanted to come. And uh, I didn't pay any attention. I thought, good, you stay there. So off I went. <laughs> off I went. I'm trying to have a quiet ride here, time with God, you know. And I'm off. And I climb up the bank. And then all of a sudden, one makes this massive jump and he jumps over this sort of like little place where there's stones in the river. He jumps and he gets over. And then the next one sees it. He jumps. Right? And then the third one. They start following me all the way up to this next mountain, right? And they follow me for the next two miles. Follow me, running by the side of me, behind me, and in front of me. And then I came to a certain point where they sort of had a little bit of a run around. It was by like in a valley, and I had to go up another mountain peak. And as I went up the mountain peak, um, something happened. A car turned up because there was a, the road that went through the valley. A car turned up. They all stayed at the car because the people got out with their sandwiches. And they were obviously there, you know, little doggies. Because I, I didn't even touch these dogs. I gave them no encouragement whatsoever. I pretended they weren't there. And uh, these people, though, they must be dog lovers. Because they were like, oh, look at these lovely dogs. Now, I carried on up this mountain. It was probably half a mile. I was right on the peak. And these dogs were just there. They're having a bit of food. And I thought, well, that's the end of it. And then all of a sudden, the people were still there trying to feed them. All of a sudden, they turned around, looked up at me, and they all ran towards me. And they chased me, and they caught me up to the top of the mountain. They followed me, right? These guys followed me. This is on the top of the mountain, the four of them. They followed me for probably something like six miles. These are two of them. All the way down into the valley, they followed me. They followed me. It was, it was really extraordinary. And I was thinking, God, what, what are you saying to me? Because the sooner they came, the sooner they vanished. I was thinking, God, what, what was that? And he said, do you know what? These dogs, these hounds, they're not domesticated. You know, those people thought they could, like, feed them they thought they could get them to consume. They thought they could like keep them there and pet them and like give them their sandwiches. <laughs> but I built these animals to go after the chase, to go after, to follow, to be consumed by the chase. And there is something really powerful about this. Just get this picture. Sorry guys if I'm comparing you as dogs, but we, we can. I just believe that some of us right now, some of us, we went on the chase with Jesus. And we got in the valley of consumerism. We got in the valley of consumer Christianity. And we said, feed me, feed me. But today, I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is stirring in you a spirit to be consumed by who he is. The spirit that when Peter turned around and said, look, where would we go? Who else has these words? This is all about you, Jesus. This is about you. And right now, some of us are in the valley of decision. The valley of saying, you stay as a consumer. You will be disgruntled. There will go a certain route where you'll just become unhappy. 
that you want to find fulfillment and peace is to be who God called you to be. I believe every believer, every Christian has the design of this sort of hound in them. You reach a river, you're going to cross it. You reach a rocky outcrop, you're going to go over it. You reach temptation, you're going to come through it. But you've got to focus on who Jesus is. You've got to focus on him. Because that's what I want to leave you with. The church, it doesn't exist for my needs. But I exist for the church. I exist for the church. Right? Guys, I want you to grab hold of that every location. The church doesn't exist for my needs. I'm going to get blessed and needs are going to be met. That's a byproduct. But do you know what? My focus, my priority is Jesus. And do you know what? When I'm part of his church, I am here to live for his church, to live for him. And I'm going to go after him and be consumed by all that he has. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.